All right, so we have explored the uh, electrical resistivity of earth materials, and there are some very uh, useful uh, properties of, uh, of rocks uh, with uh, their electrical resistivity or conductivity dependent, uh, not so much on you know, where that rock shows up on the geologic map, what color it has, uh, but uh, really on its current physical condition, how fractured is it, how weathered is it, um, and uh, especially uh, important is uh, to electrical resistivity is what uh, kind of fluid is in the rock and how much of it. You know, how much is the porosity, and um, uh, what is what is in that porosity in the rock. So this means that uh, we actually have some geophysical techniques that are um, capable of uh, examining uh, those uh, those very you know. Um, those exact uh, physical conditions, and this makes geophysical surveys of the electrical type um, useful for uh, groundwater investigations, for pollution control investigations, um, uh, for uh, maybe perhaps direct detection of uh, of oil or gas. Okay, so um, uh, we've uh, we've implemented some of those uh, resistivity techniques in the field. And this has uh, this went pretty well uh, this year in uh, the Schurz area, uh, but uh, a year ago, for instance, uh, it didn't go so well. Uh, and the reason was that, uh, uh, of course, to do an electrical resistivity measurement, you have to be able to put current into the ground, you know, from these narrow little stakes that we have. You know, we didn't have big pads to uh, uh, try to put current in over a very large area over very resistive material. So this year our stakes worked perfectly well in the uh, relatively um, um, you know sort of normal alluvium that has some clay and some moisture in it and some salt um, for uh, um, for Nevada. But uh, in the Lake Tahoe environment in the spring with melting snow, which is basically distilled water, um, and with no uh, clay having weathered out of the very these very recent uh, glacial sediments. Uh, that we were trying to profile in last year, uh, we basically uh, struck out. We were unable to put any current into the ground, and thus we were unable to measure electrical resistivity in any meaningful way. Uh, so this brings up the, the question then, are there other ways of uh, inducing and detecting currents in the ground um, than, um, uh, than by you know driving a stake into the ground and Connecting a or two stakes in the ground and connecting a battery across them and and uh, you know directly putting the current in the ground and, and of course uh, there are many ways um, and they do not uh, the the special feature of electromagnetic surveying methods which is what we're going to talk about is that they they do not require uh, that we use um, uh, direct ground contact okay uh, now when we talk uh, uh, a bit later about the uh, uh, the uh, magnetotelluric method, uh, we that that method really brings together you know measuring currents in the ground uh, through you know direct uh, electrode dipoles, uh, also measuring the magnetic field and measuring the electric field. So um, uh, there are ways of bringing that all together, uh, and they're especially used by academics for uh, very deep probing, say, of the upper mantle and lower crust, but um, for uh, engineering purposes, uh, for uh, uh, purposes of, of fault detection, or, or uh, uh, for uh, uh, water resources, uh, energy resources, um, pollution control purposes, uh, these uh, electromagnetic techniques uh, are, uh, are are very very useful, and uh, they're especially useful uh, for those environments where uh, it is extremely difficult to put a, uh, a current in the ground. Uh, so we're going to take advantage of the uh, uh, of the frequency of electromagnetic waves. Remember, our, our uh, even though our, our mini res uh, uh, ground resistivity unit, it, you know, has an actual operating frequency of, of uh, five hertz. Um, that's uh, that's only to avoid uh, setting up a uh, you know too much battery effect, uh, too much movement of ions in the ground. 
Okay, and um, it's just, it's an essentially uh, uh, direct current technique. Now, direct current means the current is the uh, is the same, certainly flowing in the same direction all the time. You know what comes out of a battery. But of course, what you have in your house is um, alternating current AC. Okay, and the current is actually uh, at least supposed to be a sine wave, and that. Um, uh, that current is uh, alternating between uh, flowing one direction and flowing another, and at the 60 hertz uh, AC frequency that we have uh, in the United States and and in Europe, uh, it's um, it's uh, uh, reversing direction uh, 60 times a second, okay, which is uh, you know not that not that fast, uh, but maybe. Uh, we should pause and, and think about uh, you know what we can do with these uh, with these waves that are alternating currents um, of uh, uh, you know alternating currents and, and have different frequencies. So we need to consider the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm giving you here the uh, geophysical electromagnetic spectrum. So we have low frequencies on the on the left and um, for instance, um, uh, the red frequency on the that's most on the left, ten to the minus one, you know, 0.1 hertz. Okay, that's uh, uh, a cycle every tenth of a second, which means that the period of the of the cycles in time is uh, ten seconds. Right? Here's ten hertz. Right? Ten to the uh, second hertz. That's a hundred hertz. Ten to the fourth, ten thousand. Ten to the sixth. That's a million hertz or, or megahertz, right? Uh, ten to the eighth, ten to the tenth, and right in the middle would be ten to the ninth, a billion hertz. That's a gigahertz, right? Um, so there are uh, uh, some things uh, that uh, uh, you know our society uses these frequencies for very, uh, very commonly, and um, the. Uh, 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 and, and you know, so for your reference, okay, um, you know the uh, uh, of course uh, direct current DC, you know, is infinitely far. Uh, you know, it's at it's at uh, exactly zero hertz, which on this log scale is infinitely far to the left, but you know, effectively uh, uh, just off the left side of the scale. Okay, um, you know, we don't care whether it's we tend we tend not to be able to distinguish. Uh, whether it's uh, you know uh, one hundred second uh, 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 you know point uh, oh one hertz frequency or or direct current we might call it direct current. Um, then in bold, uh, well, okay, so so let's let's see uh, some common uh, common uh, 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 technologies. Okay, so alternating current uh, AC power in the U.S. Uh, at 60 hertz, so that's uh, about here on the scale. All right, and uh, AM radio, okay, is in uh, uh, effectively uh, megahertz. All right, it's uh, right about one megahertz. Um, and then uh, FM radio is at uh, hundreds of uh, of megahertz, uh, below gigahertz, but uh, uh, you know VHF is at. Uh, um, you know, just less than a uh, hundred megahertz up to uh, um, up to uh, a few several hundred megahertz, okay. And then when you get uh, up to a gigahertz, you know, the TV band is essentially ends. Um, oh, there's some overlap, um, and what you have are uh, you know TV companies uh, uh, selling off that that overlapping frequency to uh, cell phone companies because cell cellular phones start at uh, uh, about uh, a gigahertz and uh, and go up uh, uh, up to a few gigahertz, not ten gigahertz, but uh, a few gigahertz, uh, ten to the ninth hertz. Um, and the uh, uh, and there's all uh, you know common things like Wi-Fi uh, that also operate in the gigahertz range. Okay, uh, you've you uh, will will hear more about uh, GPS. Which uh, uh, is operated in the uh, um, in the in the gigahertz range, okay. 
Uh, now, uh, of course, cell phones communicate by uh, radio waves, and uh, you know they they represent uh, cell phones and Wi-Fi represent you know the upper end of the uh, radio wave uh, frequencies. Uh, at the lower end, um, you know these these arrows go on for a, a ways. Here is uh, super low frequency uh, radio. Um, you know, I think uh, I think ham radio, uh, all that is is up in the you know toward the FM band, uh, somewhere within the TV band. But um, um, you know, there are radio waves used to communicate with uh, uh, with submarines uh, that that may be. Uh, uh, you know, one kilometer below the surface of the uh, very conductive uh, ocean water, and and those are uh, uh, basically operating at uh, very close to uh, sixty hertz, uh, maybe even only ten hertz. So uh, you know, on your uh, gigahertz Wi-Fi network, you can get uh, gigabit uh, transmission of data, but on your sixty hertz, uh, you know, submarine uh, nuclear launch uh, code. Uh, Type of uh, communication, um, you uh, you get uh, maybe uh, ten bits per per second. Okay, um, so uh, and you know if you're talking about nuclear watches, that's uh, that's okay. You want it to be slow, uh, and um, you want the the message to be very sure. Um, okay, so um, you know radio waves essentially cover uh, most of this uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Now I want you to notice the scale at the at the top. Okay, so at the top, uh, you know we've taken the um, the frequency and uh, let's see. You know, remember that v equals f lambda. That's true of light as well as for sound waves, and and uh, it's, it's true of radio waves and everything else. Okay, so um, if you um, if you want to get lambda, the wavelength. Okay. Uh, you just take the velocity, which is the speed of light. Uh, in, you know, the speed of light in vacuum is basically the same as the speed of light in air. You know, not exactly as the GPS people will tell you, but uh, but pretty close. And um, uh, and you divide it by the uh, by the frequency. Okay, so um, you know, at a frequency of a megahertz. Okay, for those AM radio waves, the wavelength is um, three hundred meters. For uh, uh, the uh, ten of the ninth, okay, um, at a gigahertz, the wavelength is is at about. Uh, uh, I suspect that's going to be 30, um, 30 centimeters, okay, 0.3 meters. All right, uh, you know the uh, FM uh, radio band is at about uh, uh, three meters wavelength, okay. And uh, down here, uh, you go down to thirty kilometers, uh, or up to thirty kilometers wavelength at uh, ten thousand hertz. All right, up to uh, uh, let's see, uh, it would be uh, three thousand kilometers wavelength um, at the, uh, the the frequency of AC power. Okay, so uh, you know we're getting uh, we're getting pretty. Uh, uh, pretty long wavelengths for those uh, low, low frequency uh, waves. So, um, uh, okay, what are the uh, what are the geophysical uses of this? Now, uh, you know, one of the, a very early and uh, and very uh, um, uh, very simple uh, kind of uh, uh, electromagnetic geophysical instrument is the metal detector. Okay, um, and it's operating over frequencies of uh, maybe uh, one thousand hertz to ten thousand hertz. Um, now, if you have ever used a metal detector, you know that uh, it uh, has found something when it squeals at you. Okay, uh, and you know we'll 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 get to exactly what's happening there, but um, uh, you you can actually hear the uh, frequencies that it's using um, uh, to put waves. Um, electromagnetic waves into the ground. Okay, so the metal detector is, and, and that's you know you 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 use it with uh, earphones to uh, uh, to hear that squeal, and and uh, that's when you know uh, when you've uh, when you've located something. Okay, so um, um, 
the metal detector is operating over, uh, you know, being operating over uh, 1,000 hertz, a kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. Well, that's actually the same range as you hear. And so, even though it has nothing to do with sound waves, okay, really, um, the metal detector is is one of the so-called audio um, uh, electromagnetic instruments. It's an audio frequency electromagnetic instrument. Okay, it's uh, you know, um, let's see, uh, uh, the uh, uh, A four uh, uh, A on the um, uh, relatively low on the uh, piano keyboard is um, uh, 440 hertz. Okay, so that's up here, uh, you know, well within the audio range. All right, and um, you know these audio frequencies that, that these instruments are using are just a little bit higher than that, up to 10,000 hertz. I'm su I'm sure that uh, I can't hear anything over 10,000 hertz in frequency. Um, probably you guys can. You're uh, you're younger than I am. Um, you probably hear up to uh, twenty thousand hertz, which is, you know, up to uh, up to about here on the uh, on the scale. All right. So um, the metal detector, audio uh, frequency. Um, there, I'll talk briefly uh, about uh, magnetotellurics, which is a uh, essentially low frequency deep probing uh, way of uh, looking at uh, electromagnetic fields. Okay. So that really starts at about uh, you know, in the audio range, but goes down to extremely low frequencies, and we'll see later uh, uh, when I talk about skin death why you have to go to such low frequencies, ten to the minus four hertz, uh, which is essentially uh, you know ten thousand seconds period. Okay, um, let's see, thirty seconds, thirty six hundred seconds is uh, is an hour, so that's like three hours period to the waves. Okay. Um, which is uh, very similar to the, uh, you know, not that far off the uh, diurnal variation of uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Aha! Well, there is a connection there. Okay, and uh, I'll talk about that slightly. All right. Induced polarization, you know, goes down to uh, DC. Right. We we used our DC instrument to look at uh, the uh, uh, the complex component of the uh, of the resistance. Okay, and that's really looking at the indu induced polarization effect, which really uh, doesn't occur above uh, about uh, ten hertz. All right, ten cycles per second, and you know this big red arrow here is meant to say, okay, it goes all the way down to zero hertz, which is you know off this log scale. All right, um, at the high end, okay, we have uh, ground probing radar (GPR), okay, which is up in the uh, you know, hundreds of uh, megahertz, uh, gigahertz range, and then we have um, uh, in the middle, in the audio range, there are these audio um, magnetotelluric instruments, uh, audio uh, 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 audio uh, um, electromagnetic instruments. Okay, <clears throat> and they're using uh, they're using frequencies of uh, of uh, of waves that are uh, you know in that audio range uh, you know a few hundred um, a few hundred hertz up to uh, uh, ten kilohertz. Okay. Now what what about these the names of these uh, of these instruments? There's the uh, the EM thirty one, which is what um, um, what we used. Uh, the I think it was the nineteen might have been the 1992 class to um, <clears throat> to profile across the uh, um, the Prompt Valley Fault, and we found uh, shallow conductivity anomalies it was with an EM31. Okay, and that's a very nice conductivity electromagnetic instrument. Um, it's at least as simple to operate um, as our um, um, as our mini res, and as you as you know, that's really saying something. Okay. Uh, then uh, down uh, uh, down at lower frequency is the EM34, and I'll show you pictures of both of these. Uh, these are both uh, frequency domain uh, uh, instruments, um, electromagnetic instruments. Okay, so uh, you know just like uh, all these different technologies, uh, you know right now we're um, you know society's exploiting very well the uh, 
uh, the gigahertz range, uh, but uh, you know we're extremely reliant on the uh, 60 hertz range as well. Um, uh, you know, just like society has, uh, you know, uses for all parts of the spectrum, so do geophysicists. Now, why are we talking about um, about uh, frequency of electromagnetic waves? Okay, um, why are we, uh, um, you know, why why are we um, concerned about? Uh, uh, what the frequency is, and why are there so many different geophysical instruments that are uh, uh, that are looking at the uh, uh, the different uh, uh, the different the different parts of the frequency ranges? Okay, um, and it really boils down to this effect called skin depth, which is this small Greek letter delta. Right, it's not a capital delta uh, like you've seen before. That's a small Greek delta. Okay. Uh, now, um, uh, the problem that we have as geophysicists is that our rocks are generally pretty conductive. Okay. I mean, we can we can take radio waves of of any any frequency from ten to the minus four hertz all the way up to uh, uh, you know ten to the tenth hertz, uh, ten gigahertz. Right. We can take any frequency of radio waves. And we could broadcast that through the vacuum of free space, and uh, it you know not much will happen to that. I mean, it disperses uh, according to uh, uh, spherical divergence, right? Just like sound waves, just like our the waves from our, uh, our our hammer hitting the plate. Okay, right. The farther away you are, the lower the amplitude. But uh, there isn't you know radio waves uh, can persist through incredible difference distances, right? We can get radio signals from quasars that are, um, you know, billions, uh, more than ten billion light years away. Okay, uh, you know, most of the way across the universe, we can get we can get a radio wave. All right, so so, you know, we can use any we should be able to use any frequency we want, right? Uh, uh, and why not use uh, you know for we have the same. Um, uh, resolution uh, uh, issues that we do with seismic waves, right? Um, the higher the frequency, the better the resolution will be. The better our pictures. Okay. Um, yeah, but here's the trouble. Okay, we're not propagating our waves through free space. We're propagating our waves through conductive ground. Okay, and whenever we have any conductivity in the in in a material, it's going to absorb those waves. Okay. And uh, you know that's why you can't get a cell phone signal uh, in the basement of this building, right? Um, because there's just too much metal, too much concrete, uh, too much soil between the between your cell phone and the uh, um, and and the uh, the cell tower. All right. So, uh, uh, however, you know, um, you know, even hitting the surface of a metal plate, a radio wave doesn't you know, instantly and and uh, you know immediately drop to, to zero in amplitude. Okay, uh, there's there's some depth to which you still will be able to detect the uh, uh, that that signal. Okay, uh, so uh, skin depth is defined in a in an exponential way. You know, the, the, it turns out that uh, the wave amplitude, the the radio wave amplitude, dies. Uh, exponentially, as it as it gets below the skin, the uh, the 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 surface of the uh, material, okay, and and we can examine for different experiments for different materials. We can examine, you know, what the skin depth would be, okay. Um, so skin depth is defined as the depth below the surface, you know, with the air or the vacuum, you know, effectively, um, at which the electric amplitude is decreased to thirty-seven percent of what it was right at the surface. Okay, it's basically one over e of uh, of the uh, of the original amplitude. You know, one over e is uh, zero point three seven, which is about thirty, which is thirty-seven um, percent. And uh, so we we have uh, skin depth being uh, uh, minus uh, alpha z, uh, which is uh, uh, well, 
you know, e to the minus alpha z is equal to e to the minus one, and so at uh, z equals one over alpha, we have our uh, our skin depth. Okay. Now, what what material properties uh, determine skin depth? All right. So uh, delta here, all right, is um, uh, is equal to the square root of two divided by the um, angular frequency of the wave omega. That's a small Greek omega, okay. Uh, divided by the magnetic permittivity of the of uh, free space. I think that is, um, and then divided by the uh, that's uh, a small Greek sigma, which is uh, this is let's see we had uh, omega. Um, mu and uh, sigma, and the sigma is the, uh, uh, which I hope you recognize by now, is, is the conductivity. Okay, So let's put this in, into some um, uh, terms that we're a little more familiar with. Okay, So omega is just 2 pi f, right? Uh, the frequency in hertz. You multiply that by 2 pi, you get the, uh, the uh, angular frequency in terms of radians. Okay, So 2 pi f. And the magnetic permittivity is uh, uh, four pi times ten to the uh, power of minus seven. Okay, it's a small number. And then, um, uh, and then the inverse of sigma is our familiar rho, our resistivity property of rocks. Okay, so we have two rho divided by two pi f um, divided by uh, four pi times ten to the minus seven. All right. So if you take these constants here, the two pi, the four pi, the ten to the minus seven, and you invert them, and you take the square root of that, um, you get about five hundred. Okay, where um, you know rho is in. I'm sorry, uh, the skin depth delta is going to be in meters. Uh, the resistivity is in ohm meters, and the frequency f is in hertz. Right, you get about five hundred um, times uh, the square root of the resistivity rho. Divided by the frequency f. Okay, now this has some pretty spectacular implications right away, right? Um, so how do you get a uh, how do you get a big skin depth, right? If you want to see down, right? If you want if you don't if you want to be able to measure that signal in um, in the ground, okay, or or you know see conductors that that are down, you know below the surface of the ground, okay. Uh, there's two ways you can do that. You can have a very resistive, right? If the higher the resistivity, the larger the skin depth, right? You can have a very resistive ground, or, you know, if you're stuck with the ground you're stuck with, then uh, what you want is a very, um, a very low frequency, right? The higher the frequency, the frequency is in the denominator. So, the uh, the higher the frequency, you know, the smaller the skin depth, right? So. Uh, you know the skin depth is not just a, a function of uh, of the ground; it's a function of your whole experiment because your whole experiment is going to tell you um, uh, is is going to tell you you know how um, um, your whole experiment is going to tell you uh, uh, what your frequency is that you're using. So, for instance, with a um, um, with a uh, uh, a, uh, a DC uh, 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 direct current uh, um, um, resistivity experiment, right? Driving stakes into the ground and putting currents in the ground, we're effectively using zero frequency, right? So you know, you take uh, rho and you divide by zero. Well, okay, effectively, you know, it's uh, it's infinite, right? So. Um, you know that's why uh, resistivity is uh, is is used to look very deep, uh, but the trouble is, of course, that then you have to have big long wires and you got to have huge generators and gigantic high voltages uh, that can kill people. Um, so uh, uh, you know there are other factors than skin depth that that limit uh, resistivity, but you know resistivity is is an attempt to get around the skin depth by using zero frequency, right? So uh, you know, very low frequencies then are going to have larger skin depths. Okay. So if we go back to the electromagnetic spectrum, what we see right away is that the uh, techniques we use to sound uh, the deepest are the ones that are on the left, 
and the techniques that we use to sound just in the very shallowest areas, okay, um, those are uh, those are on the right, okay. Uh, so notice that uh, you know our 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 frequency domain sounding techniques, EM34, EM31, metal detectors, right, using those audio frequencies, they have very long wavelengths, right, uh, and that uh, you know that allows us to look deep into the uh, uh, well, you know, into the uh, into sort of engineering depths, you know, maybe even up to a hundred meters depth. Uh, we want to look, you know, to a thousand thousands of meters depth. We got to use magnetotellurics. Okay, uh, ground probing radar with a frequency, uh, a much higher frequency, you know, by uh, uh, four orders of magnitude, and a uh, wavelength of only uh, three meters. Well, GPR will see. Um, um, We'll see a few meters into the ground, okay, uh, and we'll see the advantages of GPR and, and what we what we can get in those upper few meters. But you know the skin depth is effectively going to limit GPR because of its high frequency. Okay, so it, it's well worth uh, mem trying to memorize this uh, at least this skin depth approximation, right? Five hundred times the square root of rho over f, all right, um, because that that tells you a lot about uh, what your your electromagnetic uh, uh, technique is going to get you. Okay, so um, uh, the uh, uh, here's just an illustration of this of the skin depth. Okay, um, you know high frequency waves die out faster, low frequency waves die out more slowly, and they see a bit deeper. Okay, uh, actually not that different from uh, from Remy. Okay, and and uh, and surface uh, seismic waves. Okay, here's an illustration uh, uh, of uh, inducing a current on the uh, uh, on the surface of the ground. You know, maybe that current's induced by radio waves, and that current is going to die out um, exponentially, actually, with uh, with depth. Okay, uh, so uh, you know, how do we uh, uh, how how do we how do we then uh, you know, get some information. You know, we're not going to put direct current directly into the ground. We want to put uh, we want to put current uh, somewhere else, and uh, be able to cause currents in the ground. And so uh, the whole electromagnetic geophysics enterprise is based on on essentially on this uh, Faraday's law. Okay. So if you have some number of turns in a coil, okay, which is a uh, an inductor, all right, um, and uh, and you have a magnetic moment, which is a uh, uh, a, a uh, magnetic uh, uh, field strength times the the area of a uh, uh, the cross sectional area of a coil, all right. Uh, now, if there's some change in that magnetic moment, okay, if the strength of the you know, you can you can change the area certainly, uh, although that you know in the field that's kind of hard to do, but uh, that 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 would be one way to do it. Uh, but if the um, if the magnetic field itself is changing, okay, uh, that you know the the strength of the field is changing b, and of course uh, you know the Earth's magnetic field changes very slowly over about a twelve hour period, so we could think about you know getting that uh, you know very very long wavelength. Uh, you know, um, ten to the minus three hertz uh, uh, waves, just out of those uh, diurnal changes in the Earth's magnetic field due to uh, the uh, the sun warming up the ionosphere. Right, good thing about that. Um, but uh, you know, maybe we'll put in a uh, a magnetic field that that changes. Okay, you take that change in the magnetic field in the in the magnetic moment. And you divide by a change in time, right? So, so you know, wave motion is is pretty typical, right? There's always a, a change in in uh, um, in magnetic moment. Uh, you know, the, the wave is changing, uh, and and if it's an electromagnetic wave, then the the field strength can be changing, even if we hold the area constant of our coil, okay? And um, uh, and it's going to change over some period of time, right? So we put a Sine wave in right, and we'll see these changes. 
uh, and and you know we could put a, a additional turns on the in in the coil. That's uh, each turn has the same area, right? And then um, um, that'll reinforce. Okay, what do we get? Right, the larger the change, okay, and the uh, the smaller the uh, the the time that it takes to change in. Okay. And the more turns we have in our coil, right, we're gonna get more voltage. All right. So all of this, you know, changing magnetic field, um, you know, changing over uh, different times, um, that uh, generates voltages. Okay, in the coil. All right. That's Faraday's law, essentially. You know, written in, in practical terms. You know, how do you measure it? All right. So here's some some illustrations. Right. I've got Faraday's law at the upper left. All right. So we have a, a, a coil of, of wire, right? So here's uh, you know two turns of, of wire, and uh, we hold a magnet near the wire, okay? And I, I should, probably should do this this experiment, you know, um, uh, in you know in front of you uh, using a, an actual magnet and an actual voltmeter, right? Uh, and and if the if there's you know if I hold the uh, the magnet still and the coil still. <clears throat> um, then there's no um, there's no change in the magnetic field, okay, and so the current that's induced in this wire is nothing, and the voltages are nothing, okay. There's no change, right? So according to Faraday's law, there's no voltage generated. As soon as I as soon as I move that magnet relative to the the coil, okay, then that's when we get a voltage. And to get a voltage, you got to have a current. So, uh, and of course, this is the principle that um, uh, you know that electrical generators work. Uh, you know, the ones in Hoover Dam to the ones in your uh, in your Honda generator. All right. So that's uh, um, uh, you know Faraday's law. You know, in action in uh, you know in your house. All right. So. Um, um, uh, we have to have we have to have moving magnetic fields, changing magnetic fields. You know, and here we change it by moving the magnet around relative to the coil. Okay. Now we uh, you know we we have a different direction of change, and we'll get a different you know we'll get the negative of the voltage. Okay. Um, so this uh, uh, this uh, 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 acts in um, you know Faraday's law is is uh, one of those fundamental laws of, of electromagnetics. Okay, um, but when we're dealing with uh, um, materials that have finite resistivity, finite conductivity, okay, there's this uh, uh, effect called Lenz's law that um, uh, that occurs. Okay, and this is what we're going to use to our um, to our good effect. Okay, now there you know. Uh, I'm kind of get, getting ahead of the game here by uh, showing you this picture, but uh, uh, basically, uh, when there is that uh, uh, when there is that uh, EMF, that voltage generated by a change in magnetic flux, okay, according to Faraday's law, all right, the there there will be an induced electromagnetic flux, EMF, an induced voltage. And that's going to produce a uh, a current whose magnetic field opposes the change which produces it. Okay, now you can see this in inductors. Um, you know, inductors act to you know delay and change the phase of uh, of of the uh, uh, the waves that uh, you know are in the wires that go into the inductors, and. The uh, uh, the Earth uh, does the same thing, and we're going to take advantage of that. Okay, uh, you know the conductive Earth uh, uh, basically is a is a giant inductor of a kind, and when we uh, change a magnetic field, okay, you know, and 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 so we can set up a transmitter and and uh, we can put a sine wave uh, uh, of current through that, okay, alternating current through that, and so the magnetic field. That's being generated by that transmitter loop uh, is going to be constantly changing, 
and it's going to every time there's a change, it's going to induce a counteracting eddy current. Okay, and that counteracting eddy current is going to give us a counteracting magnetic field. Okay, so the inductor, you know, is resisting the uh, the changes in the magnetic field. Right? If we if we uh, if we change the magnetic field, um, you know, shake a bar magnet up and down, then the low frequency radio waves, you know, are going to go up into free space and out of the atmosphere and you know all the way out to infinity, okay, all the way out to the edge of the universe. Um, but um, uh, the um, uh, they're not going to go very far into the ground. Okay, at least in any detectable signal, uh, and and really the main reason for that is because according to Lenz's law, the the ground is going to set up currents in it that that are going to resist the changes in the magnetic field. Okay, so it's Lenz's law that we take advantage of to, you know, essentially um, find a way of putting currents into the ground and detecting those. Uh, um, those objects, you know, uh, those conductive objects remotely, okay, you know, to change the magnetic field in the ground, we don't have to touch the ground, okay. We could fly over it uh, and and induce magnetic fields without having any ground contact at all. Now, uh, uh, you know, this these these eddy currents, uh, um, the uh, uh, the inductance principles. Okay, they they come from uh, you know the basic laws of uh, electromagnetics, um, and so uh, part of those are uh, amperes and and the Biot-Savart's laws. Okay, and uh, you know so how does a current uh, induce a uh, how does a current induce a magnetic field? Okay, so um, we have now a um, um, we have a, a piece of wire here, you know, which doesn't have to be straight. And along that piece of wire, we have a, a small element. And there's a current I, you know, with uh, uh, I amps that is uh, flowing in that piece of wire. Okay, and um, so across this little element, you know, little just very tiny dl long. Okay. The current is flowing in this direction. Okay, so I is a uh, uh, I is an amount of current, and dL is a uh, uh, is a very small length, but that length has a direction. So dL is a is a vector. Okay, so there's the vector dL. Okay, um, and there's a current flowing in there, and, and so the question that this asks us is what is the um, magnetic field or the change in the magnetic field? Produced by that current. Okay. Uh, no, I'm sorry. What is the magnetic field produced by that current? All right. So uh, because that that flowing current is going to produce a uh, a magnetic field, and if it's a constantly flowing current, it'll produce a constant magnetic field. Okay. Uh, and and also you know this equation works both ways. Okay. Uh, a uh, magnetic field. Will, pro will produce a current, okay? Uh, at least a changing magnetic field. All right. So um, uh, now we need to use another another vector, and this vector is called the vector one sub r, okay? And that's uh, that's a, a unit vector, okay? The the one vector is a unit vector in the direction between where we're trying to observe the magnetic field and that little current element. All right. So what you do is you take that little current element vector and you take the vector cross product with the um, uh, against the 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 one r vector. Okay. Uh, so here you know the uh, uh, you would dot or cross uh, l with r or l with one, right? So then the uh, the cross product according to the right hand rule is going to be pointing into the screen here. Okay, and that's what it's uh, not showing so well, but that's uh, what'll happen. And then that gets scaled by the current, right? The uh, the larger the current, the larger the change in the magnetic field. Um, then there's that there's the magnetic 
permittivity of free space, mu zero, and then divided by four divided by pi divided by the distance r squared. Okay, and that gives us uh, you know so magnetic fields also fall off by r squared, right? Just like uh, just like gravity, you know that's this is how magnetic fields are a potential field. Okay, so uh, uh, you know that's the relationship between current and magnetic field. All right. So then, according to Ampere's law, right, uh, if we have a uh, uh, if we have a current that's twisting around uh, the loops of this coil, okay, twisting around the loops of the coil, right, this current I, then we're going to get straight lines of a magnetic field. Okay, it's the same cross product operating there. Okay, and here is a standard inductor uh, coil operating in uh, uh, you know in a free space. It's going to be Generating these magnetic lines of, of of uh, force, which since there is no such thing as a magnetic monopole, you know, come around back to the other side of the coil, even if they have to go, you know, to the other side of the of the world to do that. Okay, so uh, uh, Ampere's law. All right, so you know we have to put in some kind of of change to a magnetic field into the Earth, and uh, uh, and then. We'll get eddy currents. We'll get uh, uh, resistance to the changing magnetic field. Uh, you know, we'll get Ampere's effects, um, and and those are uh, those going to allow us to get some measurement of the conductivity of the uh, of the material in the ground, the the resistivity of the material in the ground. So there are two approaches. Okay, there's frequency domain magnetic EM surveying and time domain EM surveying. Okay. In the frequency domain uh, method, we we have a transmitter coil, which is going to put in its. It, we put a sinusoidal, you know, alternating current through that coil, and uh, and so that coil is going to produce an alternating, a sinusoidally alternating magnetic field. Okay, and then you know a little ways away, we'll have a receiver coil. Okay, which of course is going to see. I mean, you know. Uh, it's it's just uh, nanoseconds, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of picoseconds, uh, you know, over mo you know, for the speed of light to uh, um, to get, uh, uh, you know, from from our transmitter to our receiver coil. Okay, so that so the receiver coil will uh, uh, it will see uh, exactly the same, um, you know, induced. I'm sorry. Exactly the same uh, transmitted magnetic field, so the receiver coil will see that, uh, but it will also see something else. It'll see an induced magnetic field, which will be delayed by a whole lot more than uh, uh, you know nanoseconds. Okay, and in fact, uh, uh, we'll be able to tell that it's delayed by a certain phase, a certain you know like percentage of the uh, of the uh, of the three hundred sixty degrees. Uh, you know, angle uh, rotating around the circle that uh, are from peak to peak. Okay, you know, so here this phase difference would be, uh, you know, looks like uh, one seventh or one sixth of the, uh, uh, you know, so it would be sixty degrees um, out of phase. Okay, and that's uh, and that's due to the uh, to uh, this changing magnetic field, this sinusoidally changing magnetic field. Inducing sinusoidally changing eddy currents, okay, within the ground, all right, according to Lenz's law. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, we can have a, a transmitter uh, current, and so we got a constant. We set up a constant magnetic field which is extending into the ground, and then suddenly we shut it off, okay, and we go maybe uh, uh, you know another uh, fifth of a second or. Uh, or uh, maybe a couple of seconds, and we ramp up the uh, the the uh, current in the in the uh, in the magnetic in, in the transmitter again. Uh, you know, it does. Uh, it is possible to cut off a current um, very very fast, but it's harder to you know to instantly uh, induce a to instantly uh, start a current. Okay, in uh, uh, in our coil. In our transmitter coil, so we got to ramp it up, all right, and uh, and then we cut it off, and and we go in opposite directions because uh, 
you know, we want again we want to avoid battery effects and just measure that uh, um, that fundamental uh, resistivity property, right? That fundamental conductivity property that's the same, uh, you know, whether it goes one way or the other. All right, and so uh, we'll get, uh, you know, the the cutoff of the currents is uh, the uh, is the thing that has that the largest or, or the smallest delta t, okay, and so that's going to produce produce the largest induced voltage, induced EMF, electromotive force, okay, induced EMF, uh, induced voltage, right? So the cutoffs are going to produce these big voltages, okay. Now, however we do it, you know, in the frequency domain or the time domain, all right. Um, we are uh, basically going to have a transmitter loop, a coil, transmitter coil, and a receiver coil. And the transmitter is going to induce a primary magnetic field. And so here's uh, you know, some magnetic lines of force for you. And then down into the ground, we're kind of looking obliquely down into the ground, there's this conductor, you know, maybe a piece of a dike that's mineralized and is more conductive. Or maybe a piece of a fault zone that has saline water in it, so it's more conductive. Okay. So that um, um, uh, the uh, uh, the magnetic field is going to cut across the uh, or, or cut um, along the uh, the conductor. Okay, if it cuts along the conductor and we shut it off, then suddenly there's going to be these eddy currents. Okay, that are going to be resisting that shut off. Right. So those eddy currents are going to be looping around. The uh, you know this is, a, this is an attempt at a three D diagram here. Those eddy currents are going to be looping around those changing magnetic fields, okay? And those eddy currents themselves, but you notice that they're they're the eddy currents are constrained. They can't go exactly where they want, okay? Because the you know there's this limited uh, conductor, okay? And that's exactly what we want to find because the you know the eddy currents themselves will also generate. A, a secondary magnetic field. And so you know, not only do we pick up the primary magnetic field in the, uh, in the receiver, okay, but the eddy currents are also going to be picked up. The, the eddy currents are producing a secondary magnetic field. It might be a lot weaker, right? But it's, um, uh, it's also going to get picked up by the receiver. Okay. And so that's, uh, that's really where we uh, where we get our, our ability to uh, to you know cause currents in the ground and then measure them, okay, and the strength of the eddy currents, right? The strength of what our receiver sees that's not exactly the same as the uh, as the transmitter current, right? That strength is is really what um, um, you know that strength is going to be is going to be proportional to the um, the conductivity. Of the uh, uh, of this uh, structure, whatever it is. Okay, now we got to think about you know how do we induce eddy currents the best? Okay, so here's a uh, uh, this is actually a, a, a model here, uh, uh, an inside view of the EM31. Okay, um, and it's got a transmitter loop on the left and a receiver loop. On the right, and the, the center of the transmitter loop is 3.67 meters from the center of the receiver loop. Okay, it's kind of an awkward thing to carry around, but you know you don't have to stop and pound in stakes everywhere. Okay, so uh, you just walk around and and try to try not to get thrown off balance by this uh, 3.67 meter long pole that you're that you're carrying around horizontally. Okay, so this is a cross section. We're looking into the ground down here. We're carrying the uh, the transmitter receiver pair above it, and we're making a traverse. You know, we'll we'll start on the left side and we'll traverse uh, over to the right. Okay, and and then uh, this is a coin shaped conductor that we're looking at the edge of, right? So the conductor extends, you know, into the screen and out of the screen. Uh, but you can see it does it. It's 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 oriented perpendicular to the traverse direction. Okay. So here, you know, we're putting uh, changing magnetic fields through that conductor 
and we're getting those eddy currents because the, the magnetic fields are constantly changing. They're sinusoidal in the uh, EM31. Okay. Uh, but the, and so those eddy currents are setting up the, their own magnetic fields, right? They can't have exactly the, um, they can't take exactly the shape they would like to take in the ground because they're restricted to the conductor more or less. All right. And so uh, then we'll try to see those, those, the magnetic fields generated by the eddy currents in the conductor. We'll try to see those with the receiver loop. Okay. So um, uh, let's say uh, let's say we have a uh, um, a transmitter and uh, and and receiver, okay, and we're at position one, which is the most to the left, okay, um, and the uh, transmitter is inducing a uh, 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 an eddy current in the uh, in the vertical uh, vertically oriented conductor, um, and that's producing its own magnetic field. But but notice what happens here: the magnetic field coming, you know, when the receiver is right above the conductor, when the receiver is right above the conductor, the uh, magnetic field that's cutting through the receiver coil is uh, is horizontal. Okay, it's horizontal lines of magnetic force. Okay. And our, our receiver coil is also horizontally oriented, so there's no lines of force that are cutting, you know, through, uh, you know, down uh, uh, within the loop, okay, and so it doesn't cause any any the, the receiver any any voltage, right? So there's no no uh, coil coil anomaly on the horizontal coil. Of course, you reorient the, the coil to vertical, okay, and you would see you would see an anomaly over the conductor. All right, so then uh, um, uh, then we move on, and the conductor is in between the transmitter and the receiver. Okay, and in this case, the uh, the secondary magnetic field is resisting the changes in the primary field. So you know they're, they're going to oppose each other, and so it's going to our receiver is going to see a total magnetic field that is less than it than it was if the conductor was not there. And then we get the transmitter directly over the uh, over the conductor. And here, the the transmitter lines of magnetic force are are going right along that conductive dike, okay, and so they're not inducing any eddy currents, right? They have to be cutting across the dike, right? In electromagnetics, uh, kind of as in in magnetics, okay, all these vector things are really important, and so directions matter whether the transmitter and receiver are horizontal or vertical, right? So um, uh, the transmitter is putting out lines of force that are going right along the conductor, no eddy currents. Okay, so no uh, the receiver is not measuring anything at all. So position one we're measuring zero. There's a position three we're also measuring zero. Position two um, we have uh, uh, we have a minimum. Okay, uh, most resistance to the signal. And uh, and that's what you'll see in the receiver coil. Uh, and this is exactly the uh, you know the technique we use to look at uh, at faults um, in with the audio frequency uh, EM31. Uh, it's exactly uh, what we use to look in uh, Pahrump Valley at the uh, conductive fault. Okay. Um, now, if you just uh, uh, you know. Are surveying over a uh, um, an area that's flat. Okay, you're not going to generate uh, eddy currents, um, and um, uh, and and you know you will. Uh, well, the eddy currents are going to be kind of proportional to the uh, conductivity, and so you can get your uh, you can get your uh, uh, measurement of, of conductivity. Of course, if you um, if you have uh, uh, places where you know maybe uh, um, you know there's a change in depth, right? Then you can start uh, getting some uh, more prominent measurements, and you can do uh, you know 3D profiling with this. Uh, you know, here's a, a horizontal transmitter coil and a mobile receiver coil, and there's a conductor there. It's going to be you know its magnetic field is constrained to it, and so um, uh, you can basically go around and measure the eddy currents and where the uh, 
the eddy currents are the strongest, you know, the, the magnetic field from the eddy currents is the strongest, you know you're you're getting nearer to the uh, to the conductor, even though your transmitter is fixed. Um, you know, and you need a you know an EM thirty one can't do that kind of uh, of uh, you know fixed loop and mobile receiver, uh, but there are other instruments that can. All right. Now that's uh, that's uh, about frequency domain uh, uh, electromagnetic surveying. What about time domain? Okay. Uh, in in time domain electromagnetic surveying, you um, you have that that transmitter current that shuts off suddenly, and the uh, the induced voltage in the ground, you know, due to the eddy current, is going to be uh, in the uh, in the opposing direction. It's going to oppose the change, okay, and uh, uh, then uh, you know you 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 start up the magnetic field in the opposite direction. You shut it off suddenly, and and you're going to have this induced voltage that suddenly that, that's opposing the change. Okay. Uh, the secondary magnetic field due to that uh, um, uh, due to those you know current cutoffs. Okay. I mean there there's a there is a you know small small um, uh, uh, induced voltage. Uh, you know when you're ramping up the current. You know to start it again. But you know that's uh, that's that's too small to observe usually. So let's just you know let's look at what happens due to the induced voltages, okay? And that secondary magnetic field, you know, after the cutoff, right? It's 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 opposing, okay? Um, and it's from the eddy currents, and suddenly uh, uh, it was you know it was noticed. I I don't know by who actually, okay? That that. Secondary magnetic field from those induced currents, it doesn't die off immediately or with the speed of light. It 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 dies off much more gradually than that. It dies off over like a second. You know, even though you know the the eddy currents are only at a at uh, maybe a hundred meters depth, it takes a second to die off entirely. Um, and, and it turns out it turns out that the uh, the faster it dies off, the um, uh, the higher the uh, um, uh, the uh, the higher the resistivity. Okay, so now we can look at you know in in the time domain we can look at how fast these currents these secondary currents die off, and that's going to tell us something about the resistivity. Okay, time domain uh, time domain uh, um, electromagnetic measurements. All right. Uh, it turns out that if we put a horizontal uh, uh, transmitter loop, in other words, with a with a uh, vertical vector uh, uh, moment, okay. Uh, so we have this transmitter loop uh, lying on the ground, circular or square or whatever it has to be, okay. Um, and we shut off the current in that transmitter loop. Then we get an eddy current, okay. Which uh, you know is going to start right under the transmitter loop, uh, at you know in that instant after the uh, cutoff, you know nanoseconds after the cutoff. But uh, you know if you look several milliseconds later, that eddy current uh, is going to be it's going to sink into the ground, and it's going to it's going to um, open up in size, kind of like a smoke ring. All right, and it's you know it's becoming more ephemeral, and and you know by the time you get to time four. The eddy current is not nearly as strong, but it's it's gone down in depth and uh, and this and also uh, um, you know opened up to a larger area. Okay, aside from just being weaker. So uh, you know, looking at different times and how the uh, the strength, the, you know, the all of these eddy currents at all these different times, they're producing. This instantaneous uh, magnetic field that we can measure with a receiver loop, okay, and and the uh, uh, you know that that sinking eddy current, uh, we can tell, you know, we can maybe make measurements of how fast it's sinking in the uh, uh, you know near the surface and how fast it's sinking at some greater depth. And it turns out the the rate of sinking of that of that eddy current. Okay, is proportional to Earth resistivity. 
uh, amazingly enough. Okay, and this is in a you know this this kind of eddy current can appear can appear in a constant velocity medium. We don't need a uh, you know a, a near planar um, conductive obj object. I'm I'm sorry, in a constant resistivity medium. Okay, we don't but we don't need that that dike like uh, conductive structure. So uh, you know, back to Lenz's law. Okay, we have a transmitter loop, and here is a snapshot of the eddy current at the time when it's at this depth. Okay, the eddy current begins right under the transmitter loop. You know, at the instant, you know, a nanosecond after it's shut off, and after you know ten or fifty milliseconds, it's only propagated. You know, maybe one hundred fifty to one hundred meters in the ground. Okay. And we might be able to track it, you know, down to a whole second, you know, when it sunk uh, maybe uh, a few hundred meters into the ground. All right. So, uh, uh, you know, we have this uh, uh, kind of magical smoke ring eddy current uh, that we got just by, you know, suddenly snapping off a uh, a transmitter loop that had a had a current in it uh, until we shut it off. Okay. So that's uh, uh, you know this that's the basics of uh, time domain electromagnetic surveying, okay. Um, let's look at some of the instruments. Uh, there's such a variety of instruments. This is a L and R instruments uh, mini EM, um, which uh, I, I think would be well worth finding and getting one. So it's a two meter long uh, uh, frequency domain EM device, um, and uh, you know it's got coils at both horizontal and uh, Vertical orientations. Um, here's a, a Geonix EM34. Okay, um, and this this device uh, has two coils and two boxes, and you got to link the boxes with a with a, a cable, a signal cable. Okay, and so you know you can separate the coils by as much as you want. You can uh, you know at least as much as you have wire for, and you can uh, put the coils in any orientation. Here is a you know where both the transmitter and the receiver are in a vertical and inline orientation. You know you could have a vertical transverse orientation, you could have a horizontal orientation, uh, and you could have a you know you could have a different orientation for the transmitter versus the receiver. Okay, then also there's different distances. So here you 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 know you can set up kind of a you know seismic like experiment where you uh, open up the distance, and you take all kinds of different measurements at each distance. And of course, you're opening up in distance around some center point, okay? Or you might uh, you might actually uh, uh, you know decide you want a you know like like a constant a spacing, you want a constant distance, and you're just going to move down the line like that, okay? All time honored. Here's a photo of a uh, an EM31, a Geonix EM31, um, you know, all analog. Um, you get the it reads uh, conductivity out of a out of a a dial on the top, incredibly simple. Okay, uh, but cumbersome to carry around, but not that hard to carry around. Okay, lots of lots of measurements made very easily. Okay, time domain instruments. Uh, those those were all um, uh, frequency domain instruments. Okay, uh, time domain instruments are are much more difficult to uh, uh, construct and uh, much more difficult to interpret the data from. Okay, uh, I, I would I would agree that the uh, you know the the premier uh, time domain instruments come from Zong, uh, headquartered in in uh, Tucson, Arizona, um, uh, with an office here in uh, uh, run by a Mackey alum in uh, in Sparks. Okay, um, and uh, uh, you know the. Uh, uh, the nanotem uh, means that it's uh, sensitive to uh, time domain electromagnetic measurements, and the nano is is suggesting, you know, what kind of uh, currents it's sensitive to. Okay, so you have a great big transmitter loop for a huge um, um, uh, for a huge magnetic moment, you know, big area, large large magnetic moment, and you put a uh, you put a big current through there, big current I. And then the transmitter box has the ability to shut that off very quickly. Okay. Then you have a uh, you want a very sensitive receiver loop, so that tends to be uh, uh, you know thousands of turns of wire around a very fine wire around a uh, 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 
a circle that's uh, maybe uh, uh, the circle might be uh, um, uh, one meter in uh, in diameter. Okay, and then basically you know connected to a voltmeter. Uh, that's able to collect, uh, you know, much like a seismograph. Uh, that's able to collect the uh, the data at, uh, you know, these uh, milliseconds of time after the uh, the transmitter loop is shut off. Uh, here's the uh, the Geonics Pro Ten, um, you know, a, a, a very respectable instrument, um, but uh, not as flexible and maybe not quite as difficult to use as the uh, as the Zong. Which is really the premier instrument. Okay, so those are uh, uh, some of the instrumentation that uh, uh, that's that's uh, available or been available lately. Okay. All right. So um, I will go on uh, in the next lecture to talk about uh, uh, some more instrumentation, especially the uh, airborne instrumentation, and uh, I'll end that uh, that lecture with a uh, uh, a real quick. Uh, uh, overview of uh, magnetotellurics.